Looking for no bullshit conversation about mental health? Find Learn From People Who Lived It wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word. Learn From People Who Lived It. Welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. Well, hey guys, welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. We are going to do things a little differently today. As you may or may not know, when I left my radio job a couple of years ago, I embarked on this podcast, Learn From People Who Lived It. About a year ago, I can't believe it's been a year ago, but about a year ago, Chris Powell, the fitness trainer, and myself, who are close friends, started a new podcast together called I Needed That. Now, the goal with this pad, uh, podcast is all about mental and physical health, and we have a ton of fun too. And so I thought it would be kind of a cool idea to expose you to that podcast on this week's episode of Learn From People Who Lived It, and we're doing it with one of our favorite episodes. Uh, internally, the group of people that works on the I Needed That podcast have all said that episode number five was one of their favorites. Lots of storytelling, lots of behind the scenes, lots of talk about Chris Powell on a dating show my story of riding a bull. There's all kinds of goodness inside episode five of I Needed That. And this is me right now inviting you to join that podcast as well and make sure you're subscribing so you don't miss an episode. We drop both each Monday morning. So without further ado, here is episode number five of the I Needed That podcast with myself and Chris Powell on Learn From People Who Live. We call this thing I Needed That. It's the I Needed That podcast. I'm Matthew Blades. And I'm Chris Powell. You ready for a good one today? I am. <laughs> what were you going to say? I, I stepped say, over you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It's all good. How funny is that? You totally jinxed us. <laughs> all right, here we go. Take two. We call this the I Needed That podcast. Hi there. My name is Matthew Blades. And I am Chris Powell. You ready for this one? I am, buddy. Go ahead and uh, nod your head to this one. Mm. There it is. There it is. I don't know where this song came from, but I do enjoy it. Dude, every time the beat drops, I just start nodding yeah. my head. Let's go. Yeah. Here we go. Well, uh, welcome to episode number five of I Needed That Podcast. Uh, we'd love for you to join us online. If you have any questions that you want to ask us, we're set up at chrispal.com. Click that podcast tab. Drops down. You can record a voice memo. Like, everything's there. It's easy. It's clean. You can interact with the show. Yes. And, and we'd love to have that. And we want to hear from you. Like, yeah. it, it makes this whole thing so much fun. It's, it's our chance to talk to you and for you to talk to us. And so, and at the same time, any question that you have, I I guarantee you 100 other people have the exact same question. So you're helping not just yourself, but a lot of other people. That's great. Uh, coming up on today's show, we're going to talk about this idea behind the transitional character. You're going to talk a little bit about an elimination diet. We'll do name that tune. Uh, you also want to lean into what today? Yeah. So we, I want to talk about, well, let's take this, this morning, for example. Okay. The alarm went off. Okay. You ever make a, com- a, make a commitment? In- <laughs> <laughs> you ever make a commitment in the morning to speak clearly and enunciate your words? <laughs> and you just can't. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, but I want to talk about something that we've all we're all guilty of on a regular basis. Yeah. That's the alarm goes off and you go, "Oh man, I do not want to go on my run. Yeah. I do not want to work out. I do not want to do whatever it is that I promised myself I'm going to do." Look, join the club. You're one of us. We are going to give you some solid methods and action items to help take the baby steps into it and so you will win at the end of the day you're going to make it through it because it's not if it's when right oh, the, the day's going to happen where you just don't feel like it. and you do oh. you have to manufacture the excitement to push through that dude i don't want to work out 80 percent of the time me too it's all yeah. good guys you're I'm, but, I'm human. But then let me ask you a question. After you're done working out, how do you feel? I needed that. Right. Every time. you, There is never a workout that you regret. And I know everyone listening, you can relate. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You, Whenever it's done, you go, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I did that. I needed that. I needed that. Yeah. Uh, how are your allergies right now? Are you are you upset, no, by the way? Are you I, crying? I see you look at me. I'm wiping my eyes. No, I'm not crying. Man, I, I got to say, for probably seven months, I wake up and for the first couple hours my day it's just <clears throat> uh, then you blow on my nose and eyes watering and if people are always asking me if I'm crying because they always see me wiping my eyes I'm like no my eyes are just perpetually watering I wonder if you're eating something that's messing you up you know 
It's, it's, it, that's an interesting question to ask. And I, I thought I've done a really good job of eliminating a lot of that out, out of my diet, but there's a few things I don't want to give up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and you may have an allergic reaction to them. I, I don't know. And you know, I don't even want to talk about All it. All right, fine. We don't have to talk about it. Um, no, we can talk about whatever we. This was, I'm an open book. Let's yeah. Go. yeah. Well, then what do you what do you what do you think you're eating that you're not supposed to? Because like I can't have fruit. Fruit produces this weird allergic reaction in my body. Gives me these neurological itches. Yeah, you're, you're really totally strange. About pineapple, right? Well, any anything? any real citrusy fruits will yeah. just give me this stupid little itch on the back of my neck, on my uh, forearms. I can get it on my toe. It's like the weirdest thing in the world. Interesting. Well, so I. If the, if it is a food sensitivity, you know, I've removed, I'm, I'm gluten free, soy free. I'm, I'm lactose free, but I do consume dairy products. I, I love Greek yogurt. I love whey protein. I like your shakes. Oh man. They're the best. The best. Yeah, the I, best I, I, I just do. Ever. I'm hooked on my own product and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to give it up, but if there's anything that could be causing the problem, maybe it could be that. And I could do an elimination type diet. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's where you simply take one food group and you remove it for a couple of weeks and you see how your body reacts. It's actually a really good way to identify food sensitivities. You know, I did that with gluten. I did that with soy. And sure enough, I actually found that those actually make a difference in me. Like, and I can't argue that it was, it was noticeable. So I guess the next step would be, okay, remove all dairy based products, even though I am lactose sensitive. When I removed lactose and I put it back in, I was like, Oh, that's a problem. So I need to consume foods that are extremely low or no lactose, but there's also people, you know, milk proteins, that that's on the list of things that people can be sensitive to. And so, well, and it does possible. produce, it does produce a, uh, a inflammation. Yes. It, it gunks does. you up a little bit. Like to anybody, I had a doctor one time tell me as soon as you get a cold, stop the dairy because True. it just causes the, you know, more of the inflammation. But here's a really interesting thing that I'm learning more and more people have. And you mentioned that you went gluten free. So I have this really interesting thing that a naturopath diagnosed for me where I cannot or should not eat potatoes and grains within six to eight hours of each other. Mm. And what's interesting about that is there's a lot of gluten-free products that right. contain a rice flour and a potato starch. A lot of them do. Yep. And that can, that can jack, so that mm. jacks me up. So I can't have that particular kind of gluten-free product. Oh. So for me, it's not about eliminating gluten. I just didn't want to, I didn't feel, I didn't like the way I uh, felt when I ate wheat and, right. and, and bread and pasta and all that crap. How did you feel? Uh, just sort of heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I think okay. that's it. And then when I, when I get the, the mix of potato and grains together, mm -hmm. that's like a stomach knot that turns into a whole thing. Interesting. Oh, it's, it's really weird. But yeah. since I've diagnosed it, it's not an issue. It's just, I have to pay really close attention to it. And you feel better now. A thousand percent. Wow. When I discovered that bit about the potato and the grain thing, yeah. I was 210 pounds. I went down to 180. Wow. It was like my body went, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank really? you so much for doing yeah. that. Yeah. So I went on a food elimination diet where I was down to six <laughs> foods for three weeks Jeez. Literally a chicken, cucumbers, <laughs> lettuce. Oh my gosh. Oh man, it was pretty miserable. But in those three weeks, my body was like, hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Well, yeah, it was, I, I was like, that would explain the weight loss. Because yeah. you're limited to a few things. So like, still ate like a ton, but. Yeah, well, there was still a calorie deficit for you to get down there, which is wonderful. But also you, all the inflammation gone. So your body just released like crazy. It was really, really cool. That's wild. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really impressive. I've done something similar. Like I went on this amazing bodybuilding journey, right? So, and, and as I was doing that, you definitely eliminate a lot of things. So that's actually where I became really sensitive and in tune with my body because the moment, you know, I would compete, but, and, and, and during that process, I'm eating, you know, fish, rice, you know, very, potatoes, lots of vegetables, lots of chicken, you know, the, 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 the standard the stereotypical yeah. bodybuilder type thing. But then the moment I'd reintroduce something after I'd be like, Oh, hold on. My body really does not like that. Um, and so that was eye opening experience for me. For, for those of you who are younger, I know you feel like you can just get away with eating everything. Just wait till you hit about 27 to 30. Then you're going to start <laughs> noticing digestive issues. That's and then, about right. And then between 30 and 35, they get worse. Between 35 and 40, that's when you're like in the thick of it. Then you're like, I got to make big life changes. You're sensitive. To, you everything. figure out everything that you're sensitive to. And it's a really good, like, I'm telling you, if you're a little bit younger, go through this. And if you're a little bit older, try it. 
just try eliminating a few things, like just one thing at a time, eliminate it, introduce it back and see if there's any difference. Or you can eliminate several things and introduce one at a time. And, uh, and then it's another eye opening experience. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. jump on it. Listen, let's get to uh, name that tune. I want to have a little fun here this morning. I yeah. think I think I have an easy one, but I've been saying that every week and not always do get them. <laughs> so, you know, my favorite uh, game is Hurdle. I play it almost every day. You go to I think it's like H. I don't even know how to spell it. You go to Hurdle dot com. It's like a web interface thing and they play you a clip of a song and you have to guess it. And so far I do pretty like I do pretty well in the game. Yeah. But we brought it to our podcast. We in that sunshine state for the bump oh. ass him beat. Of course, it's Dre Pac. This is California love right there. Yeah. <laughs> so nice funny. Job, That's one of the greatest oh, songs ever, isn't it? It really is. So I was up in um, I was up in Washington early this month with my kiddos, and so we created a song called Washington Love. And uh, so I got my kids in the car. Actually, I posted on social. They're like, in this city, city of Seattle. Really? <laughs> yeah. We're at, oh, my we, God. That's we, incredible. And we just came up with all these cities in Washington. And we like, it was fun. But it, it, it was, that is a classic song. Okay. I got one for you. All right. Okay. You usually go 80s. I'm going 90s this time. Mm-hmm. All right. And so, I'm excited about so that. So let's, let's see if you can figure this one out. Okay. This is, this is I love this song. Yes. Bush, come down. No, glycerin. Yes, there Bush, you go. Glycerin. You got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, such a good song. Ta- okay, hold on, real quick. What memory does that elicit for you right now? It takes me back to a place. Wow, I'm going to be brutally honest with you right now. Okay. okay? Yeah, let, let's go. Oh my God. Come I can't on, buddy. This is coming out. Let's go. So, when I was in my early 20s, I would go and purchase bags of marijuana. <laughs> from a place called the Magic House. And let me see. I'm doing the math here. Back in your 20s, that would be illegal. <laughs> you could get away with it now. but So no. I was on a call. I was doing radio at a college campus. And, uh, and, and, and listen, I was like, well, where can I go and get a little bit of weed? And, and hey, I, hey, hold on. You're not the only 20 year old out there. That was I know. We all smoke weed. In your 20s. <laughs> yeah, I'm not like, I, like I said, it's just not something I talk about every day. But, you know, so I would go to this place and they called themselves the Magic House because you could, you could get just about anything in there. And when you walked into that home, it was either Bush or Everclear that was <laughs> yes, playing on their course. stereo at, at, a, at a level so loud you could barely talk to the person next to you. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> but See what I mean? I wasn't yes. really like, I was like, I'm going to be really honest right now. Yes. That's exactly what that makes that, me think of. That was brutally honest. Well, yeah. this is a good segue to our next bit here, which is there are all of these interesting facts about Chris Powell and equally all these interesting facts about me, Matthew Blades, that n- not a lot of people know. And you and I actually spent some time coming up with these little things. <laughs> yes. And one of the things that I didn't know about you was that you were on an NBC television show before all of this, a <laughs> yes, dating show. I was. What was it called? It was called For Love or Money. And I was, uh, no joke, I was duped into going onto the show because it was not, they surprised us. There, there's a story behind this. Please tell me there's all footage right. of this on the internet. Oh, you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it's, dude, everything's, hey man, but once it's, once it's in cyberspace, it's out there forever. Oh my God. I love and this so, so much. Yeah. So, um, a friend of mine, she actually ran into me in a parking lot and this is, they started fishing for, you know, this is in the, the heyday of reality television, right? So this yes. is like 2002, 2000, this is 2003, 2004. Oh my God. I know. And, uh, so, so, um, LA, they had kind of tapped out the whole LA market as far as everyone that could possibly be right. on a TV show. They, so they started shopping in Arizona and a friend of mine, she owns an agency out here, literally ran into it like a parking lot of a Trader Joe's or something. She's like, Chris, oh my gosh, I can't believe I ran into you. Hey, they're casting for a show and it's called adventures in love. That, that's what they told me. The show was adventures in love. She's like, but you have to be adventurous. Like, are you willing to go skydiving, scuba diving, ride a bull, do all these different things? And I was like, heck yes, yeah, sign me up. Let's go. And she's like, but you're going to be doing it. There's guys and there's girls and they're going to, they want to see if there's a connection. I was like, are you kidding me? Where can I sign? This sounds like amazing. And oh, it's supposed to be in a tropical location. So and back then, so those contracts, they, 
they were really wild. Like, they, were they ironclad? They were, but they could tell you. They literally were like, you have to be willing to do this, 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 this. this. So I signed, and then they ended up, um, they, they scheduled the interview. I did the interview. They're like, hey, you're moving on to the next. You know, they, we, we really liked you. Let's interview again. Did the next interview. They said, fantastic. You've been chosen. They flew me out to L.A. They quarantined me in a hotel for a week where I was just all by myself, and I'm, I'm ready for an adventure in love. Like, I was ready to rock. Just jump on a, on a flight to Tahiti. Let's go. I am so into this story. Oh, so they, so the, but, and it was crazy because you have a chaperone. You can't, you have no contact with anybody. And so you're just craving yeah, I guess O2, you probably had the flip phone. Yep. Yep. I, I had a, um, it was, I had a, I also want to say a Blackberry. Was Blackberry around then? But oh yeah, it would have been a Blackberry. Yeah. Or maybe it was just one of those little tiny razors, little Nokias or something. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but the thing is, and so I, I saw other people with chaperones, but it was always with guys. And I was like, okay, where's the girls? And, um, Sure enough, we were literally quarantined for five or six days. And it's part of the psychological approach because, they, you know, you isolate people, then you bring them all together and the personalities just pop. Right. So we were isolated. I didn't get that at the time. And then then they're like, they're okay, so tricky, aren't they, they are so tricky, so manipulative. So then they they move me outside to the, the front of the to the hotel lobby. And I see all these guys and we all start shaking hands like, don't talk to each other. Don't talk to each other because they wanted to to wait to capture it on camera. So they move us all outside, but you know, we kind of like make eye contact and fist bumping each other here and there. And then a whole, a whole fleet, like a caravan of Mercedes G wagons pulls up. There's like six or seven of them and they have us all get into the G wagons and there's cameramen in each of the G wagons. And we're like, what the heck is going on? I was like, this is going to be wild. So sure enough, then I'm thinking we're driving to LAX to take a flight somewhere tropical. No, they drive us straight into the Hollywood Hills into the, to this massive mansion in Bel Air. And, um, which I guess is that technically not the, that is Hollywood Hills, right? Uh, I don't know anything about the area. <laughs> okay. So they drive us to this huge mansion in Bel Air and this guy literally like, so we all jump out of the G wagons. They kind of wait for everyone to, and they, they kind of put us in place. This gentleman that was very recognizable opens up the door and goes, gentlemen, welcome to for love or money. And all, all of our faces dropped because we all thought we were going to go on this like crazy adventure, like, and do this crazy stuff. And we're like, you're going to get a second. bachelor do over. <laughs> That's exactly it. And they're like, we have one bachelorette and she's, you know, actually, no, they had, they had two that year. And, um, I'm even Rachel and I think her name was Andrea, Angela, Andrea. Anyway, so that the adventure began. Hey, I do. I made it to the top five. Which so did you go on any adventures? No, no, no. I, it was, it, you know, adventures in the, in the, you know, they took us, uh, uh, shotgun shooting and, you know, they, they had us do, you know, dates, quote unquote dates. Got it. Got it. But dude, it, I, mean, I mean, here's the thing. I met the most wonderful people. Like we had a blast. It was like, it was like living in a frat house for a couple How weeks. How many weeks are you in this uh, situation? A couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And so, yeah. In fact, most, a lot of the guys were eliminated like week one. They were gone. It was the house is down to half. And then the other, the, uh, the next week was fun because there was like six or seven of us in there and we had a blast. It was so much so fun. So did you date these girls? Did you go on the date with both these girls? Yeah, but there is, I, I didn't have any connection with either of them. So no and, kissing, no holding hands. Nope. And I was, I was very honest about it from the get go. So the, the premise of the show is you. You get her, so the, you you either you get her to fall in love with you, but at the same time, there's a check, there's a blank check, and if you hold it under a black light, there's a value to it. My check was for five hundred thousand dollars, and so and and they and you get to choose between love or money. And I was like, hey, this girl Rachel, who was like the final girl, I was like, she's awesome, she's great, I like her. I have no feelings for her. I don't think she has feelings for me. I'll take the money any day and no harm, no foul. Like it's, this is, this is cool. I wish her the very best, but if I, if she actually chooses me, I'm taking the money, but I, I, I can't play the game either. I'm not going to try to th make her think I love her <clears throat> or anything right. like that. She and I had a great relationship. And even when she dumped me, quote unquote, dumped me because there was no connection at all. She's like, it was, it was probably one of the, probably one of the best dumpings ever yeah. to, to happen on television. She's like, you have such a, and she like grabs me by the hand. She's like, Chris, you have such a heart for helping people. I genuinely appreciate who you are as a person because you know, you, this is, it, it, it shows. And I was like, wow, thank you. And I actually got choked up because like, it just meant so much that 
she felt that and I, I genuinely wanted the best for her too. So yeah. it, was, it was a really good well, interaction. And then they put me in the limo and sent me home. <laughs> that but was you didn't get experience. any money either, did you? No, I didn't get any money. Did you get paid to be on the show? I don't remember, to be honest with really? you. Really? If, if if, people if always wonder that. Like, do they compensate you at some level? Because there were all these, for years, it was like, you know, Dancing with the Stars has a whole thing. If you get to a certain, like, every level you advance, the paycheck gets thicker. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're incentivized wow. big time to work your ass off to yeah. try to get it far in the show because wow. you can get far into the show and make, like, 100000 bucks an episode. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, I'm, I better try out for Dancing with the Stars. Then. <laughs> Is kidding. dancing your forte? No, it's, yeah, not, it's not. I was thinking for me, probably <laughs> not so much either. I'll stick huh. to lifting weights. But did, so who did Rachel end up picking? She ended up picking my buddy, Caleb. Okay. He's, he's another, he's a Phoenix guy, actually. Is he? And he's awesome. Yeah. And Are they still together? No, no, <laughs> no, but, but you know, it lasted for a couple months, but you know, the, the whole thing, it was, it was at the end of the day, it was an incredible adventure and it, and best of all, it makes for a great story to tell. And it probably <laughs> set you up for all of the future stuff in your life. Wait, check this out. The reason that extreme makeover weight loss edition happened is because my friend who cast me, like I got to be friends with her because she cast me for the show. We, we continued to stay in touch and she saw what all the work I was doing, helping people lose through the weight loss transformation journey. And she ended up seeing an, uh, what my appearance on the today show reached out to me a couple years later and says, I mean, this is, this is in 2009. She reached out to me and she's like, Hey, I just saw you on the today show. Congratulations. I was like, Oh my gosh, Allison, so good to hear from you. Hey, we're actually going to be shooting some episodes here. Like, are you interested? That's the reason the whole show came about. She said, hold on, let me talk to my CEO. She had talked to her CEO. They flew me out there. We actually collabed on creating the dream show, which was like, hey, let's go help people change their lives. It was because I went on for Lover Money. Otherwise, none of this would have ever happened. I would have never had five years on ABC helping 76 people change their lives. Isn't that insane? Isn't it? I'm telling you, there are no coincidences. Yeah, it all unfolded. You're in the moment you're supposed to be yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a fun experience. How about you? Uh, any, uh, any reality show? No. TV? Uh, in fact, you mentioned, uh, in there, I don't know if you meant to or not, but you mentioned in there, ah. one of the things that is a fun fact about me that a lot of people don't know. Can you think of which one it might be? I know exactly which one it is. Hit okay. Me. So, so you did something I signed up to do and I never got to do. You got to ride a bull, a really pissed off bull named backfire, a real bull, <laughs> not a mechanical bull. I wasn't drunk. I had a Kevlar vest on, a hockey helmet, cowboy wow. boots, wow, Wrangler jeans. Wow. <laughs> I had a uh, I had a thick like a uh, uh, Wrangler flannel on. It was the real deal, bro. bro. I got a question now. You also you talked about you losing a significant. You know, you've lost thirty pounds or so. Were you heavier at the time, or were you lighter? I was a little lighter. I was in good shape. It, it actually makes it easier to ride that bull. I I'm was sure. in the, like some of the best shape of my life, quite frankly. Good. Because, okay, I got a lot of questions for you here. <laughs> yeah, because the, the bull was a part of a bigger thing. So let's go. What made you, like, what convinced you to get on a bull named Backfire? So I was doing, uh, okay, this is all stereotypical ba uh, old radio stuff, but I had an old producer who was a really manly man. And he came up with this idea because I'm quite, uh, I have a lot of feminine energy. Okay. And he said, he said, we're going to get you your man card. <laughs> Just, I hate that term, but right. whatever. So he came up with the man card challenge and we solicited advice from our listeners. And we basically came up with five things that I could do to be a man. Oh my gosh. You love this? Yeah, this, this is, is so good. awful. <laughs> so the first thing that I had to do was get a tattoo. Wow. So that's the Buddha tattoo on my left. He's holding up an old school microphone. A lot of people think that's a beer can, but if you look, there's a microphone. Oh yeah, I see it. Oh my gosh. So I got a tattoo. That was the first thing that I had to do. And then I had to learn, and then I had to drive and park an 18 wheeler. Wow. <laughs> it was crazy, <laughs> I, I got questions about that. Dude, that was insane. Uh, that was so insane. <laughs> um, I had to do the firefighter challenge. Oh yeah. Which if you've never done that before, it's up and down. I think it's like, Three flights of stairs, three I times. I thought it was more than that. I think it was six. Six or yeah. Okay, it, it is six. six yeah. So it's six flights of stairs. You have to go up and down three times wearing all the stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you got to do the dummy drag. Dummy drag. You got to do the, the the chopping wood thing. That's where like, it. Yeah, you like you have to like kind of flip on top a big of tire. It. Like yep. you're lifting something yep. off of somebody, so yep. you lift this huge tire ten times, five out, <sighs> five back. Dude. And then, then then you do the dummy drag, yeah. and then the last thing you do is you you um you take a big ass sledgehammer and you try to open a car door, yeah. And then you go to grab the hose and you spray something down. Yeah, it's exhausting. Hell yeah! But again, I was in literally the best shape of my life during this whole experience. But you know, then there were a couple of other things. But one of the other things that made the list, the finale, was riding a bull. Dude, I, how many muscles did you tear in this process of getting your man card? So I'll be honest with you, man. I, I, I honestly have never been more scared in my life than I was riding that bull. For sure. It was, it was really like uh, the most terrifying moment in my entire life. Wow. Uh, because of the, the magnitude of the bull. Yeah. The fact that I really didn't have any expertise in bull riding. Yep. Um, but I, I'll tell you the story if you want it. I, I'd love to hear the story because I'll tell you straight up. I have a buddy who, on a on a bet, rode a bull and tore his bicep in the first two seconds. That bull bucked once, pop. Are you kidding I mean, me? Oh yeah, no. The, the, this thing, it's no joke, dude. You're playing with a two thousand I mean, pound bull, uh, and it will kill you, and it can kill you in seconds. Okay, so, so my ahead. ride was scary. <laughs> my, my, my definitely, but I lived. Uh, okay, so I get. Here's the thing about the bull riding: is you, you don't even understand this. You get so you go to the the what is it called the stall or wherever they keep the bull. Yeah, Where do they keep the yeah. bulls? What are they, the corral it, or something? It's not. It's a bullpen. It's a bullpen. Maybe that's yeah, what it's called. Right, so he's yeah. in the bullpen, and what they tell you to do is they say you, you need to step on the bull. And he needs you step on each side of his spine, and then I want you to slide your feet and your boots around his belly, really wow. close, like hug him, so yeah. he he can feel that you're getting on and that something's getting ready to happen. Yeah. So I put my feet on the bull. I sit down, and then they start um, tying your hand down. Yep. So what you don't know if you've never ridden a bull before is they basically put your hand like underneath your butt. Yeah. Like it's like right underneath your ball sack kind of, right? Like yeah. that's where the hand position is. And then they tie it down with this rope that's got all this rosin on it that's really sticky and really tight. And they they tighten your hand so much that I literally said to the guy, is my hand going to come out of this? <laughs> yes. I mean, it was so tight on the bull, yeah. which of course that, that tightness is what makes the bull kick. Yeah. He didn't like yeah. that. And so I get on the thing and in the whole time, everybody's telling me what's going to happen. They're saying backfire is going to jump out of the gate. He's going to go left. He's going to go right. He's going to spin. He's going to try to buck you off. And if he bucks you off in that first time, he's going to come after you. Wow. So if that happens, you need to get Get away quick. Yeah. Now, of course, all of the things are in place. The clowns are there. The, the professional people Bro. are. I know. Can you, do you see why I'm so what scared? What is going through your mind at this time? I am sweating profusely. Oh. I'm having all of these because my wife is there and my two kids are there watching. Oh, me. my gosh. And I'm li I literally have the thought you don't have to do this. Like you don't this. No. You know, this isn't what being a man is. No. You know, putting yourself through, <laughs> through, <laughs> through you know, possible death. That's not oh. what makes a man. And um, long story short, we finally get to a point where they're ready to open the gate. And the bull comes out and does everything they tell me it's going to do. Left, right. Left, right. Tries to buck me off. I, la I last 4.8 seconds on the bull. Hey. It's pretty good. That's about four more than I would last. <laughs> I last 4.8 seconds on the bull, but he does buck me off and he comes straight towards me. Wow. And he lands his foot goes right into the side of my thigh oh. and it felt like you ever been kneed in the side of the leg yep right when you yep. were a kid and Dead leg. stupid people would do that to you <laughs> okay so i get that feeling oh. and then uh, you're just on adrenaline yeah because you're on the ground and literally you can see this thing coming right at you it's terrifying oh. i mean it's oh. terrifying it's, it's so close and so you just scooting as fast as you can back 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 and i got up and i was totally fine and um i had a contusion on the side of my leg that lasted for weeks but I'm the sure. craziest thing about it for me was because they tell you that your hand is really just there to help you keep your balance right you're holding on to the bull with your legs and your uh. feet and I got, I was purple, purple from my oh. knees all the way up to my psoas muscles oh. because I was holding on f so tightly. Wow. And Man. just the friction of bouncing up and down and just those muscles just getting worked. Oh my gosh. I mean, bro. I did. I probably have some photos somewhere. Oh, yes, please. You I have to pull those out. Purple. 
you we you have to pull those out. We'll, we'll post them somewhere. <laughs> oh my god! But it was really. Um, have you ever seen the footage? No, I gotta see. It. I, I here we can pull it up and play it a little bit because well, it is so, interesting. Tell you the question, please. Do you do you have your man card? Oh, of course I do. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> so I, I see a few of the things that you got. So yeah, I did. Uh, I got tattoos. I did all the challenges. You went five for five. Huh? I went five for five on the whole good thing, on, man. Good on you, buddy. Yeah, this is good audio because uh, you can you can literally hear the crowd. Oh, there it is, Matthew Blades Bull Ride. Like it comes up, like Dude, everybody wants it. it. Oh. <laughs> about that bro. oh my gosh so now here's i watch that and immediately I don't even like watching that immediately my back hurts mm. like because i'm watching this thing and i'm watching you i mean he as he's bucking your head is traveling three feet up oh, and three feet down at and least just the jarring in your lower spine and you got a bad back. I would never do that again. <laughs> I was gonna say because <laughs> I mean you, you've never. been you've been through a lot with your back, but I, I'm watching that. I'm just thinking, like, okay, deep down inside, that looks kind of cool. <laughs> I'm glad you did that early on, also, so you could hey, check it off the list. Mm-hmm. It's done because mm-hmm. it, it, it's something that's that's not even a possibility with my my back right now. Heck no, you wouldn't do it. I, I would be way too terrified. I've got a, a herniated L5 S1, bulging L4 L5. I, especially seeing that, I'd, I'd end up flat on my back for a month, probably. <laughs> and so just, uh, it sounds it's good, lot. but man. It's a lot. Yeah. Well, oh, that's cool. I want to talk a little bit about um, folks who, who want to get started. Uh, it's one of the things we teased up front that we would help people, you know, with that first week. And But let's start with this idea of people that want to make some transformation in their life and some real tangible things that they can do right out of the gate. Um, in that first week. Yeah. And, and so this is, I mean, and I love speaking to this because this is just, uh, something that's so, I mean, millions of people out there just, they're looking to take the first step and they don't know where to start. Um, one of the very first places, and, and the thing is that there's, there's several different things that we can do and let's, let's explore them all and, and figure out which one kind of really resonates with, with you who's listening right now. If, if you're looking to take the very first step on the journey of transformation, um, I guess I, I do want to preface something though, that the conversation that we have about transformation is a little bit different the way that I like to approach it. And it's not, it's not about diet or exercise That's or what I appreciate like about that. you. It's because it's real transformation. <clears throat> it's not part-time transformation. This is the full-time lasting way to do it. Yeah. And, and when you're in the trenches, there is diet solutions and there are exercise solutions. And, and these are things that you're going to apply. But if you actually take a step back from all of that and look at it from a 50,000 foot perspective, it's much more profound than that. And, and so our approach to, to the journey of transformation. And, and again, I say transformation, not weight loss, because when, when I say transformation, I'm talking about a shift in your mindset and your lifestyle that leads to improved physical, mental, and emotional well being. And so it's really all about keeping your promises to yourself. Like it's, it's about setting small daily commitments. And, and it, I love it because the industry is really starting to move this way because they realize that this all or none mentality, this, you know, hardcore diet and, and yeah, it's sucking down 40 metabolite <laughs> pills a month. Oh, all yeah. that crap. And broccoli and chicken and these, you know, 45 minute sweat sessions that just leave you exhausted. You know, it's like, no, it's, it's not about that at all. That's, you know, while that can elicit some results, it's not sustainable in the long term. So it's like, okay, how do we really approach this and give people a better understanding of themselves. And so I love this whole, the, the baby step approach, but the way that we actually talk about it, we, ch- we change the, the, um, we change the language around it to saying, look, it's, and it really is about keeping your promises to yourself. You, t- you just make that one small daily promise. You keep that promise and then you continue to grow it from there. So let's just get into nitty gritty very first week. What is it that you want to accomplish? It's like, if you've had a moment of clarity, you think I am ready to make a change. Well, they've actually, and, and the, the medical literature, the scientific literature has actually proven that there's a lot of benefits to vividly seeing what it is that you ultimately want to achieve. So like, what is this end goal? What is it that you really want to achieve? Is it, is it a certain number on the scale and what does that number mean? But, or is it fitting into your, the jeans that you wore in high school? Is it climbing Mount Kilimanjaro? But, but 
beyond just saying what it is, you, it's, it's really important that you wrap your senses around it. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does it smell like when you wake up and when you've reached that goal, you wake up in the morning, you climb out of bed, you put your feet on the floor. What does that person do? Like, what does that, what is that real deep visualization? It's deep visualization. And it's important that you do that early on in the process because, and because the way it, it actually connects neurons in your brain, like it, it starts to prime the brain for this process. However, they also say though, once you've established what that goal is to, to stop to stop looking so far down the road at what that is. It's, it's important that you establish what it is. It's almost like, Hey, we're right here in Arizona. You want to, you want to drive to New York. Okay. Let's, let's think about what that's going to be like in New York. We can, we can chart the, the map there. You know, we're going to take you through Dallas and then up into, you know, through little rock and into Lexington, Kentucky and up to New York, whatever chart the course. However, once you actually set course on that, don't think about New York anymore. You, you focus on the here and now, on the baby steps to get there. So one of the very first things that you want to do is set a smart goal. And we talked about this a we little did. bit in, in, a former, in the earlier podcast is make it specific. Know exactly what it is that you want. Measurable. So you actually know when you're on track and you're not. Is it attainable? Can you genuinely do it in your everyday life right now? When you use water is a great <laughs> example of that, right? Because that's yes. a great, easy Entry point, easy to measure it. Exactly. Oh, hundred percent attainable. And that's going to be one of those daily things that that's one of those daily commitments that you're just going to focus. You're going to put, you're going to take your gaze from where it is you ultimately want to go. And you're going to look straight down and you're going to focus on what's the next step in front of me and the next step in front of me. And every once in a while, you're going to look up and you can reestablish that end goal. But actually, as far as motivation goes and the, the neuroscience behind motivation, don't keep looking at that end goal. It's kind of like saying, I want to climb the mountain. Okay. But if you keep looking at it, it just, it can feel really overwhelming if you continue to stare, you know? So instead you've looked down and you focus on just one foot in front of the next. And, um, and that's exactly what you do. So week one, establish where you want to go. You set a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant. Is it relevant to you? Like you do genuinely want it. So that's going to actually be a priority in your life. Yeah. Because you could pick something that's important to somebody else that you think is important to you, but it's really not a hundred percent. Yeah. And if you've got other priorities like your career or your spouse or other, other things that are pulling you in different directions, and those are going to take priority over this. Well, that's, it's important. At least you understand that and know if you're not can actually put the time aside necessary to get this thing done, then maybe it's not, it's not essentially, it's not that important to you, but because th- this thing is going to require some time, some thought and some effort. Now, granted, it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be 10 minutes a day that you're actually making progress toward it. And if it's, t- if it's that, just understand that your progress isn't going to be as fast as you might want it to be. And then the final aspect of that is it, is it time bound? You got to put a date on it. You have to say, Hey, I'm going to reach this goal by this time, you know, by December 31st, I'm going to achieve this by June 1st of next year. I'm going to achieve, um, you know, this specific weight. I'm going to, you know, run a marathon, I'm gonna, whatever that might be. So establish that you, that's the number one thing you want to do. And then you're going to come back and then it's really important. We lay out okay, what are we going to do today to get you 1% closer to that? And this Mm. is where you scale it all the way back down to keeping your promises. And this is where you, and you know, it's, it's really interesting because I've, I've made a career of helping people lose significant amounts of weight. You know, people who have actually had the, the tallest mountains to climb and the longest journeys to, to undergo. And most of them, they come from a very dark place. Of they lots of childhood issues, hundred yeah. percent, and it's, and and that's that definitely something that we can address in the future. You, you know that uh, they've actually found in, in some some recent research, uh, they the the number they used to actually find, they felt it was forty percent of women who struggle with their weight come from some sort of sexual abuse when they're younger. They actually found the numbers closer to fifty percent. Um, and it does so, not surprise me in my line of work. I see it all the time. A hundred. We, amen. And and same. And, and this is something that is, um, I mean, it is, it is an epidemic and I'm not talking about the obesity. I'm also talking about sexual abuse. Right. And, and so you, you certainly have so much more compassion for people who are struggling with this because it is, it has created neurological changes in that child. And that's also led to metabolic changes. So it's not like you don't just sit there and say, well, you need to eat less and exercise more. Oh, it's not that simple. Worse off, it's created a set of beliefs in them 
worse off, it's created a set of beliefs in them. I have yeah. to say it twice because it's so important yes. that you understand that. It's yes. not just as easy as switching on and off a switch. Why can't you just go to the gym and start eating less? Like it, it isn't that simple. No. There's a whole set of beliefs that are set up in somebody when they are abused. Yes. And that becomes the reason they can't get over the hurdle because yeah. they don't have the belief. That's that's exactly it. And 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 what they've actually undergone those neurological changes as a child that that yes it changed their belief system but on top of that it also um th- many of them obviously they, they they turn to food for comfort for protection to create a layer so that it would it would reduce their sexuality so it, again it would protect them from the attacker and then but even going through that they also because of those neurological changes it created metabolic adaptations mm-hmm. and so th- it's it's a I mean, it, it's a battle. It's a real battle. And that's why, you know, for a lot of these, for a lot of people who have undergone this, number one, look around. And I hope if, if this has happened to you, if you are a victim of sexual abuse any time in your life, look around because you're not alone. And you can, you, it's, it's, the statistics are saying that 50% of the, of the women out there who are struggling with their weight are also victims of sexual abuse. And so that's, a, if, if there's any message I want to get out there, you're not alone. N- n- message number two. And I know we just went on a little tangent here because we were talking about first steps. My but favorite kind. I really, we, this is something we really need to address because this is something that's affecting hundreds of millions, millions of, people millions of people around the world. Yeah. And tens of, at least tens of millions of people here in the United States. I mean, we got 75% of our population is struggling with their weight. Uh, 40%. Is it that high? 75%, yes, are, are overweight or obese. 40% of America is overbeat, or is wow. obese. Wow. And so, so, but it's not just about consuming too many calories. There are, there are issues, there's trauma that, so, that millions of us have experienced that's leading to this. And so one of the, one of the aspects, the interesting aspect, aspects of trauma is the shame, the guilt, and the feeling like you're all alone. Mm-hmm. Look around, you're not alone. Join the millions of people who are suffering through the same thing. And just, so know that, and then know that there's a way out. And the thing is, you with help. And this is where I, I, I really would love if you're still struggling with this and you can't seem to let this programming go that where you continue to relive that abuse and you continue to fall back into numbing the, the, the pain with food, et cetera. Um, I can't stress strongly enough that you talk to a licensed therapist, psychologist, um, psychiatrist who can help you because you can reprogram that you can you can free yourself. You can release that trauma and begin the healing process. And so you don't have to be trapped thinking that you cannot change your body. And, you, and when I say change, not just physically and mentally and emotionally, you can free yourself from this prison that you've created. And so, um, yeah, I, and again, I know there's a tan- tangent, but I really need to get that message out. Well, and I want to put even more wind behind your sails. When I was in my retreat, I think I've talked to you about this before. They gave me this, this idea was presented to me that I was a transitional character in my lineage. Mm. Okay. Uh, And, and so let me define that because I looked at the person that said it like they were crazy too. It's like, (laughs) I think I understand that, but what does that mean? And transitional characters by definition are, here to end the family dysfunction. They're here to end the Mm -hmm. generational cycles. They're Mm -hmm. here to move their lineage forward. And if you've been a part of a family that's had lots of dysfunction, if you've been a part of a family where there's been abuse in the family, consider for a moment that you're the person who is the transitional character. Mm. And now I want you to lean into that fully. You're the person. You're the one who's here to move the needle for your lineage. You're the one that's here to change it all so that your kids don't go through this same cycle again, so their kids don't go through that same cycle again. That's cool to me. That's powerful. I think so too. You can really lean into, because then at every moment when you have to make that decision on, do I go this way or do I go this way? You have a compass. Your compass is that you're the transitional character. So you're either moving in a way that's getting your family out of this dysfunction or you are choosing to stay in it. Yes. Yes. That's so powerful. Like you're taking responsibility to make things better and not just for you, but for the next generations. That's powerful. 
I love it. I can't think of a greater sense of purpose either, which is, that's actually one of the, the antidotes for despair, right? Yeah, right. And if you find yourself in a bad place, if you can, if you can take responsibility to make things better and you can find a purpose, you can make things a lot better for yourself. Let's talk about this. I was talking <laughs> about with uh, my hockey team that I, that I run around with and um, in sports, there's this whole thing called performance on demand. And once you get to a certain age, that's the expectation is that, you know, I know you're not going to feel like it today, but the game is today. And so you have to perform today. Right. How important is performance on demand when you're going through, you know, a weight loss journey or a transformation journey? How important is it to just push through on those days where you don't feel like it? And here's the thing. It's not like sports. The, the biggest thing yeah, that's is what I wanted to ask yeah, the question. Yeah, and and I, I really, I love it because that doesn't necessarily apply to this because the, guess what? I would, I'm actually going to go out on a limb here and say the majority of your days, you're not going to feel like it. In fact, I'm going to say probably 80% of the days, only about 20% of the days that coffee's kicking hard and you're ready to rock and you want to get after it. And you want to, you want to, you know, fulfill those commitments and see those promises through man, 80% of the time you ain't feeling it. The best thing you can do is go through the motions. Okay. And talk to me. Talk that's, to me. that is absolutely without a doubt. I think one of the most powerful things you can do because a, and, and, you know, Newton said it best, a body in motion will tend to remain in motion yeah, right, unless right. acted upon by an outside unbalanced force. And so it's the craziest thing. But if you're not feeling it and you're like, ah, oh, the last thing I want to do is work out, just go out there and finish the warm up. That's it. And you'd be blown away. It's like if you put your and, and this is actually one of the sayings in the recovery world. Put your body into motion and, your, and then your mind will follow. Mm -hmm. Because if you sit there and you start to think about it, after about five seconds or so, you're going to talk yourself out of it. Your mind will talk you out of everything. Just put your body into motion. And it's the wildest thing. And sure enough, you'll be out there and you go through a warm-up. And you're not tricking yourself. And by the way, if you just commit to doing that warm-up and do the warm-up, you win. But if you feel so good after that warm-up and you're like, oh, maybe I'm going to do a couple push-ups and a couple squats. Hey, that's gravy. That's gravy. But the biggest thing, though, is is... And, and, and this is going to go back down to those promises and those commitments. It is important that when you set those promises, because you also need to understand that we're not going to be, we're not going to feel that motivation most days. And so that the commitments that you make have to be so easily attainable and so doable that you have to know that you can win them on a regular basis. You have to keep yourself winning in this process. And so this is actually going to, it's, it's a perfect way to circle back to what I was talking about. Like I find people in a really dark place. Why did they get there? You know, granted there might be some past trauma, et cetera, but the, the, the reason I, I, I find people with, with such broken spirits it's because of broken promises and, and that my saying, and I, when I share this with people, it really resonates. I say, look, I'm looking at you right now. I see a beautiful human, but I don't see, you know, 150 extra pounds of body fat. I see 150 extra pounds of broken promises. Mm -hmm. And, and then once we, once we dive into it, it's like, how do you feel about yourself right now? The answer is always, I hate myself. Look at me. And the shoulders are rolled forward and you can just see this darkness and this despair. But most of the time, they don't know what got them there. They actually, gen they're like, I've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. Okay, there might have been a root trauma. They might have turned to food to comfort themselves. However, it was when they tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. That's it's that was what it actually destroyed the wiring there. Right? That's what that is what absolutely destroyed the wiring is the trying and failing. What we don't realize is that when we try something, when we attempt something, deep down inside we're almost we're making a pact with ourselves. We're, we're writing a contract saying, I'm gonna do this, and then when you don't do that. It is the, the most valuable thing in the world, which is our dignity, the, our esteem, our confidence, our, our self-love. That's what takes a hit. When you make a promise to yourself and you break it, that is the most painful and detrimental and destructive thing in the world in my world. Because, and I get people out of that just the same way they got themselves in. And so, and, and I, I try this with everyone. In fact, on, on day one, we actually start this thing. I say, guys, if you, if you think we're going to sit here and talk about diet and exercise, you're wrong. We're going to talk about integrity and dignity and, and teaching you how to love yourself. And so right off the bat, I'll say, I'm, and I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to say, most of you don't have integrity. And you can imagine, you know, people shifting in their seat. And, oh, dude, screw, yeah, screw, screw you. you, man. I've got integrity. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. I'm, I'm not saying you don't have integrity with other people. You know, John, if you told Sarah that you're going to, you'll, you'll meet her tomorrow at noon, you'll be there. What time will you be there? He's like 1157. I said, absolutely. Of course he would. 
John, how many times have you said the diet starts Monday? And he goes, oh, man. I said, so you got integrity with other people, but you don't have integrity with yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the integrity I'm talking about. Hey, um, Lindsay, how many times have you said 2016, this is my year, January 1, it's all going to change. Oh, how, how about 2017? How about 2018? 2019? I can keep going here, guys. And everyone goes, oh, look, we got integrity with other people. We don't have it personal integrity with ourselves. And what people don't realize is that when you make a promise to yourself and you break it, the damage is so destructive to who we are, to our being, to our soul, to our ability to love ourselves. So the only way to get people out is to have them make a small promise and keep it and then make another small promise and keep it. And slowly but surely we can climb out of the depths of hell that they've put themselves into. And we do it with drinking an extra quart of water a day. Yeah. It's not just drink an extra quart of water a day. It's the commitment that you're going to keep over and over. And that's why you have to keep it every day because it's so much more, it's bigger than water. It's love. It's your ability to love yourself. And I'm teaching you how to love yourself again. And we do that with water. And all of a sudden after two weeks, everyone's drinking their water and they go, Oh, I, I could do this. I say, okay, how about steps? How many people want to take on 3000 steps today? You know, and it was oh, 3000 steps. I, I could do that. Okay. Drink your water and let's do 3000 steps. And sure enough, they start doing that and they go, well, I wonder what else I can do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, now, this now is, it's getting good. This, this is, I got goosebumps because as a coach, this is what you wait for. It's like you, they're starting to believe in themselves again. They lost all that belief. Every time they broke the promise, they didn't realize the damage that was being done. They're gambling with the most important. If you listening right now, if you, if you are making these silent promises to yourself and you're breaking them, you are destroying yourself. You're destroying your ability. You're destroying your, your belief in yourself, your ability to love yourself, your confidence, your self-esteem. Break it all down. Start small. And you have to build yourself back up again. One promise at a time and you can get there. Yeah, hear me when I say that putting yourself first doesn't make you selfish. It's literally the only way we ever get the best version of you. To change that behavior, it's hard. I'm going to acknowledge that. It's hard and that's okay. But if it's something that's genuinely important to you, that's, that's also why it's really important that we lower the barrier of entry so that that change is small enough so that you, it is doable enough. Yeah. So it's not too hard that you don't want that you don't do it every day. Yeah. Cause if, if you don't do it, man, not, now we're dealing with a whole new problem because now you're breaking a promise and you're doing more harm than had you never made the promise in the first place. All right. Yeah. So would you rather, we got three of them. Okay. Here. Uh, would you rather, and then we're going to wrap up for the day, uh, have a dog with a cat's personality or a cat with a dog's personality. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good one. I like it. Yeah, do you? Yes. I think I would take... Because <laughs> a cat wants nothing to do with you until it wants you. Typically. Then, yeah, typically, yeah, yeah. Exa for, for the most part. Um, I think I would probably take... I'd probably take the cat with the dog's I personality. I think so. I would, too. Actually, yes. So we have a sphinx cat at home. Did you know oh, that? Oh, no way. Those are gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Luna's her name. She's wow. beautiful. Yeah. She's a, a gorgeous sphinx cat. And um, she sphinx cats have more of a monkey personality than a cat personality. Wow. And which is a little bit more like a dog. They're yeah. a lot more interactive. She's got so many different voices that she uses when she walks around. Oh, my God. She talks all day. She wants to be everywhere we are because she's naked. Like the yeah. Any fur, she loves to be as close as she can to you. Wow, it's a totally different experience having a cat like that. She's very much like a dog. That's so wild. In fact, her and our other uh, a Chihuahua, we have a Chihuahua named Millie. They play together like they're two dogs or two cats. That's amazing. It's See, that's crazy. Cool. See, and and I'm I'm naturally a dog guy, but I think a cat with a dog's personality would be so much fun. So bomb. Oh yeah. All right, here we go. Would you rather visit 100 years in the past? Or 100 years in the future? Well, I go 100 years in the future. Would you just uh, to see what's yeah. up? Yep, 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 exactly. Yeah, like, you just have to watch Back to the Future Part 2. <laughs> and then you're like, all right, I would go into the future and buy one of those betting books. So the, the ah, sports books, right? There you go. There you go. So you got a little strategy behind no, it. But huh? How about yourself? Um, so we're at 2022. So I'm going back to what? Do the math. Uh, you'd be going 19, back to 2022. 
Yeah, 1922. Oh, and hell no. So like we're in the middle of the Depression, isn't it? Oh, bro. Yeah, those are some rough times. Come on. on. We're 100 years in the future. Okay, last (laughs) one. (laughs) This is tough. Would you rather sit sit alone in a house on the weekend or go and hang out all weekend with the most boring person you know? (laughs) (laughs) That's way too easy, man. I recharge by myself. Dude, that that sounds like every other weekend for me right now. I literally sit here alone. And charge up. Yeah, I just charge up. I get work done and... And yeah, and I organize and I just get, I prepare myself for the week ahead. You? Mm, man, How that's about you? interesting. I probably would, would go out and really? hang with some people, even if they were a little bit boring. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I, maybe I, I don't know. Now I say what? that out loud and it's like, well, what am I going to talk about? What are we going to do? Are you just going to stare at each other? Yeah. Would that be exhausting? All right. I just want to sit at home too. Yeah. So, so I, I heard this actually, you know, you, you, people throw out introvert, extrovert all the time. All and the and time. I don't know if this is like the clinical definition of it, but, um, I was listening to a psychologist or psychiatrist actually. And he was saying that one of the ways to identify if you're an introvert or an extrovert is actually, it's how you feel, you know, you can have an introvert who can be the, the life of a party or an extrovert who wants time alone or something like that. But do you, so the, here's, here's the way that they, he helps classify them. And I don't know if this is correct, but this, it, it caught my attention. Um, an extrovert will go into a crowd of people and will actually, it will increase their energy. They'll almost get recharged around other people where an introvert gets re, they, they'll recharge by themselves. If they're in a crowd of people, they'll leave exhausted. You know, and then, or an extrovert, if they're not around a lot of people, they'll get drained and they'll seek that connection, like that, that connection with people. And then when they're around people, then they, they get fired up. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say? If, I'm, an if, e- I'm an extrovert by that definition. Okay. Because when I'm around people, I, I tend to get fueled up. Yeah. When I'm in by myself, I can get a little too heady. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's good. I think I, you need that flow. You uh-huh. need the, the up and the down there. But uh, by and large, when I'm around people, especially like minded people, yes, I leave feeling really energized. I do, too. I do, too, which is interesting. But mega energized. I tend to I tend to isolate and spend time by myself thinking that that's what recharges me. However, but if I'm or find myself around other people that aren't trying to take, you yeah, know, suck or, your energy or just down. suck the energy, man, I get, I get fired up and I'll leave super recharged and I'll be like, oh, I haven't even had coffee. So I think the lesson here is that you have to hang around the right people. Ah, if you're an extrovert, I think that's exactly the right. Lesson. Yes. Yes. I hear it too. It's like if you're an extrovert and you're hanging up around people and they're draining you, they're the wrong people. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's time for all of us to kind of look inward at our own lives and look at the people that you're around, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, it's like rally that, that team. And if the people around you are sucking that energy out of you, especially if it's family, friends, and loved ones, you don't necessarily have to remove them from your life, but perhaps expand your circle to some people that will recharge you. And put in a couple of boundaries that make sense, that are healthy, that aren't derived in anger and all of the things that you've been choosing to keep inside. Yes. And then start to see what happens. All right, guys, listen, don't forget about all of the things that Chris has going on. In fact, I just got a text from my wife. She says, I feel so much better. I just took a package of Chris's magic powder. (laughs) She's talking about the caffeine, the boo shot shot that you got. You want to tell me a little bit about those? Yeah, I got to formulate that one. That was was a blast. It's instant caffeine and sustained release. We actually suspended caffeine and gelatin. So it's, uh, so it actually gets released after about 45, 50 minutes. So you get two little spikes of energy, but then we combined it with no tropics. So there's no jitters brings you down. So you're just calm, crisp, clear. It's, uh, it's, it's fun, but while the ride is nice, the flavors, that's what really makes it. So. Oh, man. And well, we had the flavor guy on last week, yes. Matt, talking all about that. That's what it's all about. Super cool, man. ChrisPowell.com. I encourage you to visit the site. That's where you're going to link to everything that he's got going on. And we'll see you next week. Man, I needed that, Chris. How about you? I always do. I feel so good now. Every single week. That's fun. All right, what do you want to get into next week? So next week, I want to tackle a question I get all the time, and that is about when's the best time for cardio? Is it morning? Is it evening? Is it afternoon? Is it before I eat? Is it after I eat? I mean, you can imagine. And and the the research out there, you know, people, people argue this a gazillion different ways. So let's tackle it once and for all. 
And also, we're going to talk about foods that get you in the mood. Are there any foods in particular that... You'll have to wait till next week for that. Okay. <laughs> All right, fair uh, enough. We are also going to do Name That Tune, Would You Rather. And I think my favorite moment of next week's podcast is when I sniff you. <laughs> See you next week. And I needed that. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of I Needed That. Subscribe to that podcast right now so you don't miss an episode when it drops each and every Monday. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks for listening.